Hey guys, this is Stephen Kyle, and I'm the pastor of Highland Park Baptist Church. And I know here in Bay County and the surrounding areas, we continue to live in chaos and turmoil. You can see our sanctuary behind me, but I'm so glad that you've chosen to tune in to our weekly broadcast this morning as we talk about truth for tough times. We're going to open up the Bible and we're going to study it and we're going to realize that God's Word applies to us right where we are. So even though we recover from a hurricane, we still serve a God that is on His throne. Thank you for tuning in today. I pray you'll be blessed. Today I'm going to start with you on a journey through the book of James, a letter that he wrote to the early first century church. But just as miraculous as all the Bible is, not only did he write it to them, but it's still very applicable to us today as well. And so the title of this series that we're going to be in is simply Truth for Tough Times. Truth for Tough Times. You look at the graphic that our media team came up with, there's that cross bent. It'll be bent if you go there today at the top of our steeple. I've had folks ask me, when are you going to fix the cross? That'll be the last thing we do. That'll be the last thing we do. We want to make that a crowning achievement. But the reason why we put that cross up there is because we want everyone to know that drives far and wide, that can be seen at a far distance, that the cross is of the utmost importance of everything that we do at Highland Park Baptist Church. And so that'll be the last thing we do, but that is kind of a reminder. I don't know about to you, but to me that, you know, hey, it's not really supposed to be leaning that way. We, we've had some difficulty. And so this is truth for tough times. Let me ask you before we even dive into it this morning. When difficulties come your way, how do you react? How do you respond? I mean, when things are going well and the sky is blue and you got plenty of money in the bank and your health is good and your children are obedient, it's easy to praise the Lord then, isn't it? But when things are going tough, your physical health is not, well, it's not doing very well and, you know, you, 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 you run out of money before you run out of month. You know what I'm talking about? And your kids are being disobedient. You have problems with your family, maybe even problems with your marriage. It's easy for us to think, well, faith is not really an option right there. And I would even agree with that statement. It's not an option. Faith is an absolute necessity when we find ourselves in tough times. And I can honestly stand before you today and say that the most difficult times in my life have been times where I have grown the most in my faith. Most of you guys are familiar with my own personal testimony. That when I was 21 years of age, I was involved in an automobile accident and it broke every bone in my face and it crushed my legs. And for a year and a half, I was undergoing surgery after surgery after surgery. One of the most difficult things that I've ever went through in my entire life. And yet now I look back upon that and I say, hey, if it weren't for that, I would still be a spiritual baby. If it weren't for that, there's no way that the, the maturity that has occurred, and listen to me, i got a long way to still go, but there's no way God used that to accomplish great things in my own life. I would even stand before you today and be bold enough to say that apart from the day that I was saved, the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my life is when I fell asleep driving home one night when I was in college and I hit the side of a rural bank, a rural bridge embankment in West Tennessee. You have your own story as well. And see, guys, when I stand before folks and you stand before folks and you say, hey, some of the greatest things that have ever happened in my life have been some of the most, uh, the most difficult, some of the greatest trials, some of the greatest suffering, that God took that trial and God turned that trial into a triumph. If you're not a Christian, you can't understand that. Have you found that to be the case? 
That people who are not Christ followers, they do not understand how God can give us the strength not only to make it through difficult times, but God can also give us the strength to take those difficult times and to bring about good in our lives and to increase our faith. But I want us to learn today from the Bible. Look there in verse 1. Every one of us as Christ followers can have those trials turned into triumph. Look at what he says there. He says in verse 1, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. He's writing to the Jews that were in captivity. They've been scattered all across the earth. And so he is writing to them, but do not mistake the message that he has in James. Again, is a message that is to us today as Christ followers as well. Let's talk a little bit about James. James here, we believe, is the half-brother of Jesus. He was a half-brother because they had the same mother, Mary, but they had a different father. Jesus' father was God. James' father was Joseph. So he was a half-brother. Now, James, being the younger brother of Jesus, he grew up. You know, they grew up together, living in the same household. Can you imagine them playing together, interacting together as, as brothers do when they grow up together? It's interesting to me, though, guys, that James, when he begins this letter, James, who was the pastor of the church of Jerusalem, he was the head elder there. Notice when he writes this, he doesn't say, James, a bondservant. Bondservant means slave. Or maybe you have a translation that says servant. He doesn't say, James, a bondservant of God and the half-brother of Jesus. What does he say? James, the bondservant of God and of Jesus Christ. At some point in James' life, he came to realize, hey, Jesus is more than just my half-brother. Jesus is the Lord of the universe. And the same transformation, if you know Christ as Savior today, is something that occurred in James' life as well that would lead him to get to the point where he would start this letter saying, hey, I want you to know that I serve Jesus just like you do. And then right off the bat, he's like, you know what? You're going to face trials. And I'm going to share with you how Jesus, the Lord of the universe, can take these trials and turn these trials into triumphs. Four words that we see in this text. Let's look at the very first word. It's joy. Count it all joy, he says, when you fall into various trials. Not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. And the Bible says there are going to be trials of all kinds. The King James Version translation uses a phrase, diverse temptations. You know what that means? It means very colorful is the actual rendering there. Here's what it means. Trials come in all shapes, all sizes, and all colors. It could be a physical trial. It could be an emotional trial, a financial trial. It could be a marital trial. Man, we could go all day long talking about the problems that we face. That's the reason why he says when you face all these various difficulties and all these various trials, the question is not are you going to face them. The question is what are you going to do when you face them? You cannot control what comes into your life. You can only, through the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit being manifest in your life, control how you respond to what comes into your life. That's what James is talking about there. He says in verse 2, count it all joy. The word count, or maybe you have a translation that says consider, it's an accounting term. It means, to, it means to, uh, to, to take account of, or, you know, if you're here and you're a CPA, you're an accountant, people who work with figures, that word count, it means to establish an account there is what he is literally saying. 
It's a picture, guys, of this. You writing down everything in your life that you would consider to be an asset in one column and then coming along and writing down everything in your life that you would consider to be a liability in another column. And then you look at both of those columns and then above it all, you write these three letters, J-O-Y. You're like, well, I'll write it above the asset column. But not the law. No, that's not what he says. In life, guys, in life, when you write assets and liabilities, there's one thing that you need to write in the asset column, and that is the power of Jesus Christ. Because there is no liability in this life that can rob the power of Jesus Christ. It'll not dilute it. It'll not detract from that. He is Lord of all. And you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. That I'm going to write joy over the liabilities in my life. And you know why it doesn't make any sense? Because I guarantee you, if we were to take a poll this morning, most of us in this room would have 10 times more liabilities than we have assets in our life. Rejoice in the Lord. In every situation, in every circumstance, rejoice. Matter of fact, this is not some suggestion that the Bible is making. This is an absolute command as followers of Jesus that we rejoice in every situation. Now notice, it does not say we rejoice for every situation. There's a difference. Hey, Lord, I thank you that I have cancer. Who in their right mind would make that comment? But I give you joy that even in the midst of this cancer, you're still Lord and you're still sufficient. And you're going to take this and you're going to use it to grow my faith. I can promise you guys that that, that, that 18 months that as a 21-year-old that I was going through recovery and hearing he'll never walk again, he'll never smile again, you know, uh, trying to rebuild the face and all those kinds of things. You know, it's amazing. I'm still mad at my parents to this day because I was so swollen and bones were broken so bad that they asked my parents for a picture so they could put my face back together and my folks gave them a literal picture of me. And I'm like, why didn't you go to the JCPenney catalog and cut one out? Here's what he looks like right here. Only a mother could love that face, right? I can promise you during that I didn't say, hey, I give joy that I'm suffering. Hey, I give joy that, 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 that I'm having to deal with this difficulty. Hey, I give joy that I'm going through surgeries. Hey, I give joy. I promise you that never came from my lips. And I would love to tell you that at the time, I'm like, you know what? I'm writing joy above it all. That didn't happen. Again, this is not me and you. This is the very word of God. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. It is not a suggestion. It's a command. Rejoice in every circumstance, in every situation. You say, well, I don't feel like rejoicing when I'm sick. I don't feel like rejoicing when I'm sad. I don't feel like rejoicing when I'm mad. I don't feel like rejoicing when I have difficulties in my life. The Bible doesn't say rejoice if you feel like it. It says rejoice, period. I want to share something with you today. It was exciting for me. It may not be as exciting for you, but this literally revolutionized and made a difference in my demeanor and my personality and my countenance when I got this point. Rejoicing is not a feeling. Rejoicing is a decision. Let me say that again. Rejoicing is not a feeling. Rejoicing is a decision. There is a difference between happiness and between joy. Happiness is built upon what happens to you in your life. Joy is not dependent upon your happenings. Joy is dependent upon one thing, Jesus Christ. That's joy. And the Bible says this about Christ, that even though I'm not guaranteed tomorrow that this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Next week, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. I am guaranteed this tomorrow, that Jesus is going to be the same tomorrow as he was today, as he was 100 years ago, as he was when James wrote this, as he will be tomorrow and forever, evermore. 
And that's how I can write joy above it all. The Word of God says rejoice. Count it all joy. Philippians 4.4. 4. It talks about rejoicing. Listen to what it says. It says, rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, just in case you missed it the first time, rejoice. You're like, well, okay, that, what's the big deal about that? Understand who wrote that. Paul wrote that. This was written by a man who, when he wrote it, was in a dark, dry dungeon. All he knew the next day when he woke up, they were going to take him out, and they were going to chop his head off. And he wrote, rejoice. The entire epistle of Philippians is about rejoicing in every situation. And so, guys, listen, the Bible says that if the trials that you're dealing with in your life, if they're going to be turned into triumphs, you're going to have to rejoice right in the midst of those afflictions and difficulties. I have a friend who keeps a sign on his desk and here's what the sign says. It says, rejoice even when you don't feel like it. Keep rejoicing until you feel like it, and then rejoice because you feel like it. Rejoice. The very time that we need to be rejoicing is when we don't feel like rejoicing. Folks that even don't even know Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, thank you, God. Why? Because something good has happened in our lives. And so, guys, listen to me. When we sit there and we count it all joy and we rejoice when good things are happening in our lives, when we feel like rejoicing, that's no different than somebody who doesn't know Christ. But I'm telling you, when you find yourself in difficulties, when you find yourself facing trials, that's when you rejoice the most. That's when it makes a difference. That's when it changes not only those that are around you, but I'm telling you, it'll change your own attitude and your own countenance, and it'll change your heart. Rejoice. Count it all joy in every situation. The closest person to me to ever die was my maternal grandmother. She had had a series of heart attacks, and it led to long-term heart problems, which led to acute pulmonary edema. In the last couple of weeks of her life, she was there in a the hospital, and she was unresponsive. My family and I were able to come to the point where we said, you know what, Lord Jesus, I mean, we're going to count it all joy. We're going to rejoice. We're not rejoicing because she's suffering. We're not rejoicing because she had, you know, she has heart problems. We're not rejoicing because she's in the hospital. We're rejoicing over the fact that she knows you. We're rejoicing over the fact that we know very clearly she is going to be healed. Either she will be healed and walk out of this hospital, or she will get out of this hospital a quicker way. And she'll be healed. Count it all joy when you face various trials. Write J-O-Y over the top of it. I'm going to rejoice in you, Christ, because nothing that is happening in my life is going to rob you of who you are and the position that you hold. Look in verse 3. So if I'm going to turn trials into triumphs, I'm going to have to have joy. Secondly, I'm going to have to have knowledge. He says in verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. He says you need to know that when your faith is tested, I'm doing a work in your life. I'm producing perseverance. I'm producing patience. That growing through tough times brings about in the life of a Christ follower more faith. Faith is like a muscle. When you don't exercise that muscle, all of a sudden it gets weak and it atrophies. Faith is the very same way. See, guys, when we're going through wonderful times and everything is right and you don't really have to exercise a lot of faith, but it's when you're going through those difficult times, that's literally when faith is all you have to hold on to. I've had folks say to me before, well, you know what, if I could just see a miracle, if I could just have a miracle in my life, then I would have faith. 
Hey, guys, miracles do not produce faith. Faith produces miracles. That's exactly what the Bible lets us know. We have some folks out there that honestly, they are miracle mongers. Here a miracle, there a miracle, everywhere a miracle. If you had your miracle, I've had my miracle. How do we know this? It's all throughout the Bible. I'll give you an example. Luke chapter 16. Jesus tells us there about a rich man who dies and goes to hell. He didn't go to hell because he was rich. He went to hell because he put faith in his money instead of God. And he's in hell. And then there's this poor beggar named Lazarus who had trust in the one true God. And he goes to heaven. And so he's there. And the rich man, he's in torment in hell. And Jesus tells the story that this guy had one urgent request. He asked Abraham to send Lazarus, the poor beggar, back down to his five brothers who were still alive. And here's what he said. Let Lazarus warn them not to come to this place. And I want you to listen to this profound statement that Abraham responded with. He said, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they'll not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. It's not miracles that increase your faith. The Bible says it's trials that increase your faith. We learn in the difficult times. That's the reason why he says in verse 3, the testing of your faith develops patience. We can go over to the book of Romans chapter 5, 3, 4, and 5. It kind of tells us why the trials or the testing of our faith brings about perseverance. Listen to what it says. It says, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance is patience. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. That if you want to get in on God's plan when it comes to developing your character, if you want to get in on God's plan to, to making you more mature when it comes to following Christ, to making you uh, conform to the very image of Jesus Christ, here it is. God allows suffering to come into your life. God allows you to go through trials. God allows your faith to be tested because God knows those produce patience and patience character and character hope. Regardless of what anyone tells you, there is no shortcut to character and hope. They only come through trials. Here's an overarching question. Why did God save you? You say, well, God, God, God saved me um, so I could be forgiven of my sins. No. That's a great benefit of being saved, isn't it? It's a wonderful byproduct of being saved. Why did God save you? Well, God saved me so I'll go to heaven when I die. That's another benefit of being saved, but that's not the reason God saved you. Why did God save you? What is the purpose of his salvation? He saved you to con conform you into the very image of his son, Jesus Christ. God saved you because God wants to work in your life to where daily you become more and more like Jesus than you were the day before. That's according to Romans chapter 8. He wants you to be like Jesus and grow like Jesus in your character. And there is no shortcut to that happening. There is no easy way, guys. There is no feeling that you can have. There is no pill that you can take. There is no Christian experience that you can have that's going to make you more like Jesus, that's just going to automatically take place. It is through suffering and trials and tribulation and difficulties that he shapes you daily more into the image of Jesus. That's why you've been saved. God can't use people until they go through some suffering. I should be honest with you. You're like, well, that's not a pep. That's not really a pick-me-up. What happened to seeker-friendly sermons? This is the Word of God. 
See, you can look at it one of two ways. Oh, man. I'm going to have to go through some trials. Oh, this is miserable. I'm going through trials. And by the way, if you approach it that way, it's still not going to change the fact you're going to go through trials. Or you can say, you know what? I'm going through a trial. But I'm not going to waste this. Hello. I'm not going to waste this because God promises he's going to use it to make me more and more like Jesus. Attitude. Countenance. That's what he's wanting to change in all of us. There are many examples in the Bible of this taking place. According to Genesis, Joseph spent eight or 13 years in service in prison before he finally got to the point that he was number two in command of all of Egypt, the very position that God was leading him to, so many folks may be saved. Moses was 80 years old before God could really use him. He had to go through a 40-year time of tribulation on the backside of a desert before God could get him ready. Patience and perseverance, it's got to finish its work so you can be made mature and you can be made complete. And understand, friend, no one is perfect except Jesus. It's not talking about we get to the point where we're without fault. He's talking about being mature. A life event can cause the way we view something to being out of kilter. That ain't quite that bad. I'm talking about something even greater than a life event. I'm talking about a life that the very reason that you have life is because God wants to work through you and God wants to use that suffering that we don't necessarily embrace. God wants to use that pain. God wants to use that trial. Hey, can I get a witness this morning? Anybody been through any difficulties in the last couple of months? Raise your hand. Listen, God wants to use that and it seems weird, and it seems out of place, and I'm up here saying, right, J-O-I above it, and you're like, that just doesn't seem right. I'm just saying that God wants to so move and work through that that you get to the point in your life, it'll not be now, I promise you, but you get to the point in your life where you look back upon that and you say, you know what? Man, that's the best thing in the world that could have ever happened to me. My God is good, my God is faithful, and he uses that trial, he uses that suffering so that he might use that life that Jesus gave his life for so that you might become more like him, and it only happens through suffering. Joy, write joy above it. Knowledge, don't you know, James says. The pain, he's using it to produce patience, which produces character, which produces hope. This is Pastor Kyle, and I would like to thank you for watching our program today. Uh, we especially want to thank our sponsor, Perry and Young, Attorneys at Law. Hey, let me thank you for taking the time to watch our program today. I pray that you've been blessed by it. Our prayer is that you found the teaching to be Christ-honoring and also biblical. If you've got any questions about anything that was spoken about today, we would encourage you, shoot us an email, info at highlandpark.org, or give us a call at our church office, 850-785-6530. Uh, if you've been encouraged by this message, we'd love to hear from you. Again, shoot us that email, or if you uh, say, you know what, I believe in the ministry that Highland Park is doing, and I would like to support that. And friend, you give us a call, 850-785-6530, or you go to our website and you can give your tax-deductible gift to support the ministry of taking the gospel far and wide through this local television station. Hope you'll watch us again next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great day.